Now, Brady, you're certainly not the only person that has some concerns or skepticism regarding mandatory forced compulsory vaccinations. The general public are becoming alerted to this and likewise becoming concerned. But there is also voices emerging from the medical fraternity around the world. Can you give me some information on what the doctors and the medical staff, the infectious diseases experts are saying about COVID and vaccines? Well, when they're allowed to say anything, because the censorship is just absolutely unbelievable right now, and that's a concern in itself, obviously. Um, there's many, many, many doctors, many experts, many scientists with very high peer uh, um, recommendations who are speaking out very, very loudly about this vaccination and what it does and what COVID is and isn't, and um, they're just being heavily, heavily censored. And so I think it's, it's particularly frustrating when people talk about the science and the experts because all of the scientists and all of the experts that have been handpicked from the government are all heavily compromised, heavily compromised. And, and, and so there's lots of doctors speaking out. Look, this, this raises the topic or the concern that, that I frequently find myself thinking about, and that is simply what I call separating fact from fiction. It's getting more and more difficult to do that. We, we saw this recently with the Donald Trump versus Joe Biden election in the United States. You had media who were not being impartial or objective. They had an agenda. They are expected to be as, as, impartial, as impartial as possible, but unfortunately that doesn't always happen. And again, we're seeing this with the vaccines and with COVID and with lockdowns and restrictions that, that border on martial or maybe soft martial law at this stage, but which could get much worse, much more restrictive. Oh, it will, yeah. And, and, and science and figures are so easily compromised. It's very, it's very easy to do. I mean, someone sent me some figures from the UK about how there was 40% uh, ICU numbers had gone up 40 to 50%. And I looked into the article that they sent and they increased the number of ICU beds 40 to 50%. So it had gone from 680 beds to 1,053 or something. And ICUs are designed to be full. ICUs have been full forever. The, the, the NHS has been at capacity for however long. There's always, you could look back on articles from 20 years ago and the flu season's at capacity, there's people in the hallways. But that's, that was the article. So, so ICU admissions, people in ICU have gone up 50%. There was more beds, that's why. The capacity had increased. <laughs> that's the figure. And so it's so easy to, to heavily compromise any type of, even even as, even stats. I mean, they they just changed the um, they just changed the uh, regulations or or, or, or a, a rules or whatever it is around what it takes to be a COVID death. And all of a sudden, it, it, they change it from thirty days, I think, to sixty days. And so, if you tested positive or ninety days, so if you tested positive, which the tests don't even work, but if you tested positive within thirty days and you died from anything, motorbike accident, absolutely anything at all, and bearing in mind that. The average age of death from COVID is 85 in Australia, or 86. The average age of death in Australia is 84, and these people had two and a half comorbidities. So these people are dying of old age. But regardless, if you died of a heart attack from heavy heart disease, if you tested positive for, for a, a COVID test within 30 days, then you were a COVID death. But then they, they increased it to 90 days. So you tested positive for a test that doesn't work 90 days before your cause of death is COVID. So that just opened up a whole new, new more figures. We've, and then they can announce that actually the figures, the, the COVID deaths have gone up and, and these, this amount of increase has happened. But it was just a stroke of a pen that caused that. So the statistics, the official statistics can be very easily fudged and therefore are not entirely reliable. I think we've all heard that medical facilities, hospitals, doctors are getting some sort of kickback if they list a cause of death as COVID-19. Can you tell us a bit about that? What, what benefit would a hospital derive from saying someone died of COVID-19, whereas, as you just said, uh, but the person had a motorcycle accident? Mm. What, are they getting some sort of financial kickback or yeah. are they simply being forced to fudge the statistics? Yeah, well, America is an example because that system's private, so that just goes to show how easily compromised that could be. Right, all they have to do without any tests, even if they just uh, just um, assumed that maybe they had a sniffly nose, 
then they could write COVID-19 as a death and get $39,000. I think it's 39000 Who is paying that money to the, the government? Money? The government is paying money to the hospitals? That's right. And so you can imagine how that filters down. The CEO of this hospital, the, the directive would be, put as many COVID deaths as you can down. Of course, they're trying to run a business. They're feeding the shareholders. The doctors can't speak out because they'll lose their job. And a lot of people are heavily programmed in this in every direction, and, and doctors and scientists are also heavily brainwashed and don't know which way is up in a lot of cases. And so um, he could convince himself quite easily if the directive is to write COVID-19 that that person did have a snuffly nose. <laughs> and so, yes, I probably should write that. That's the right thing to do here. Not to mention the pressure that they're getting, not to mention that they're probably getting bonuses for it. I mean, when you privatise the world to the level that it's been privatised and, and when you look at the, the jump off the cliff into further, private, further privatisation which is what this is all about. I mean, we are being sold out, absolutely. I mean, we, this, the world is being privatised. That's what this virus is about. Then um, you're gonna, you, you, it's going to be compromised. It's, it's going to become a, a money-oriented, decision-making world, and that's what this is. But what, and, and why would the government pay? Why would the government pay for that at all? Shouldn't they be, A, trying to quell the, quell the hysteria to continue on so the business can get on and so we don't crash the economy? No, because that's not what they want. They're crashing the economy on purpose. Do you see privatisation as actually a form of corporatisation? I mean, they're, they're very similar concepts, but, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are concerned that governments are being replaced by corporations, and as it so happens, generally, um, of course, you're going to find that they are for-profit organisations. And it's already happened, and that's why this is happening because we've already been sold out. This is this is the this is the the tidal wave that came before the the, the slow build up of swell, and so we've been we've slowly privatised most of the public assets because the corporations run the government, and this is the this is the the whale is now going to engulf everything, and everything will be privatised. There'll be no more private healthcare, public transport, and unless you're on the grid and, and whatever and vaccinated vaccine passports and like that, um, you have to pay for all of the roads and so they've been stealing our taxes and they're going to continue to steal our taxes and take more. I mean this, these, these are extraordinarily greedy people and power hungry people and, and there's no lines like we think they are between corporations and the private, the private world and, and governments and even countries. The, the reserve banks and the World Bank and the monetary funds are all owned by the same people and they've got their fingers all over the world. So even people who, I mean, Australia's been sold out heavily, but even the, the countries who haven't sort of got the actual tentacles on the ground of these people have either been blackmailed or they've got no choice um, into buying into this because, um, because, that, because they've, they've been bullied into it or they've sold themselves out and that's what a lot of this debt that... Um, when you look at what some of these bigger countries have done, getting these smaller countries into debt, they're shackled to this system, they're shackled to these people, and they've sold themselves and their people out. And so if, if they can't afford to pay back those debts, as we're seeing in some countries, in return, in exchange for paying the debt, infrastructure can be handed over, absolutely. taken control of. Airstrips, airfields, ports, mines, gold mines, silver mines, whatever... <laughs> And, and to who? This, this is, those, those assets are not going to other governments. If, we, if, if, if Guam or something owed, if someone owed us money, then uh, we, we don't get $10,000 in our bank because we now own an airstrip because it's not the governments that are, that are pulling those strings. The world has been privatised. The corporations run the world. Who's in debt to who? Where do all our taxes go? We've been sold out. And these people are extremely greedy, power-hungry psychopaths.